<clears throat> Good evening, <clears throat> St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. This is Pastor Thomas, and I'm glad to see you all tonight uh, as we join together on the Zoom uh, on the Zoom and the phone line. Thank you for joining us another night and living in expectation. I'm grateful for each of you for your continued faithfulness and diligence as we uh, study the Word of God. I'm grateful for each of you who have continuously uh, tuned in to hear a word from the Lord. And I'm just grateful for what God is doing in our midst. I, don't, I used to ask the question, I hope we know it, but I know that each of us know that we've been strengthened. That's why we're still here. We're going to do one commercial break today. Let us do this. Uh, we've been together three years now. But one thing I still want to push because the Lord continues to lay it on my heart to share is let us be open to try to, let, let, I used to say, get a friend. Find one family member that you can encourage to join us in the living in expectation. Find one somebody you're related to. Let them try it. Don't tell them they got to come every night. Just say, try try to come on expectation night one night and let us hear and, and, and let, ask them to hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so sometimes it just take a taste. I used to like Brussels sprouts. Um, and with somebody, Reverend Edwards, um, cooked them with some spiciness and some sweetness. I don't know what they did, but once I got that, that Brussels sprout flavor, I go back and get the Brussels sprout from that same place because they won't give me the recipe, but it's spicy and it's sweet. I tasted it. I thought it was good. And guess what? I keep on going back to get them. Let's invite somebody to join us in the word of God and let's watch what happens when they try test stuff. Tonight, we're in the book of Acts chapter two, and this is one of my, I, and I, I, chapter two, as I said, is exciting. But as I continue to study, every chapter is exciting, but chapter two at the very end gives us the foundation, the hallmarks of Christian belief, Christian. Matter of fact, before I forget, let me say this. St. Peter has a new app, and I meant to tell y'all this Sunday, but I forgot. St. Peter has a new app, and if you go on your app, app store on your iPhone or on your Droid, all you got to do is put St. Peter. Miss Simpson, you on here? If that's all we need to do, put it St. Peter. That's it. Spell out St. Peter Missionary Baptist. It'll pop Spell in. It. Spell out St. Peter Missionary Baptist in App Store. We have our own app on the Droid platform as well as on the iPhone platform. And when you get in, just sign up and it gives you all type of things. I, so, so those of you on the phone line, let me show it to you. Um, it comes on and you see pictures. Some of you will see yourselves on this app. If we have a lot of pictures, it's very great. Sister Samson, God bless you for taking point on this. We have, um, um, you have a ministry, what ministries, what ministries are doing. So each of y'all should submit something, what your ministry is doing. We have St. Peter News. We have a lot of things that we just, we just started this week. So join us. Uh, you can get any of the messages that come on um, Expectation Moments, Sunday, Sunday School, any of the St. Peter messages are on this app. So if you want to go back, you ain't got to go far. Just go on your app and, and click messages and scroll back because they go back so far. It's, 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 it's a long way. All right. Also, you can give on the app when you, you can uh, sign up to get live stream uh, where they can tell you uh, where they can where they get an announcement to let you know to tune in on the app. Um, events, you can make a prayer request. And on this app, you have a Bible. So if you're somewhere and you don't have your Bible, you want to reach the Bible, click on the app and it got the whole Bible on here. All you got to do is click. So I want to just, everybody ought to do this. Now, this is free. You ain't got to pay for it. It's just free because you got a lot of apps on your phone. I've seen some of y'all phones. Y'all got a lot of apps. Go ahead and get your St. Peter app so that you can get the notifications before class, but just a reminder. Um, and you can just, all you got to do, Miss Simpson, remind me, all you got to do is click on and want you to be able to get the right, right to Zoom. Yes, it has expectation on this. You can click on expectation and go straight to our class. All you got to do is click the click on expectation. You go straight to class. Also, you will see some inspirational messages that over the, the Lord has given. And so I want you to, you know, just, just do it. Just do it. I don't ask much. <laughs> go ahead and sign up for the St. Peter app. That's the end of my commercial break right now. But I'll be back in the room. Tonight, we are in the book of Acts chapter two. Uh, We're coming down to the end of chapter two. Um, as, as this chapter opened with the movement of the Holy Spirit, the much rushing mighty wind, as this chapter opened with all the disciples speaking in all known tongues, with uh, Peter preaching and declaring the gospel of Christ, um, the amazing news of God, as he preached about the prophets, those prophets, as he preached about uh, three different prophecies that David made, uh, as he preached Jesus' resurrection, 
and that it proved that Jesus is Lord in Christ. As we see all these things, the Bible says that the result of this preaching, and I want to start at verse 40, and the Bible says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Matthew McCoy, rise of class, okay? And so he said in verse 41, now this is what happened. After the preaching, after the movement of the Holy Spirit, let me, matter of fact, let me back up a little further. After they met together on one accord, after the Holy Spirit came, it was like a rushing mighty wind. After they spoke in tongues, after Peter preached, after he preached Christ and his resurrection, proven that Jesus is Lord in Christ. After he did, after he preached, the Bible says in verse 37 that the men of Israel asked the question because they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter was crystal clear. What did Peter say? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, he goes on to say, for the promises unto you. He lets us know the promises to them. Who? And to all the children and all that are followed, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's two things he has already said. For those who call upon his name, for those who repent and be baptized in, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, they shall receive the Holy Ghost. And, and the promise is not localized, but it's global. It's for everyone who will do these things, who will, who, will, who will call on the name of the Lord and who will repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I like that. In addition to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, they shall be saved. Now, in verse 40, he says uh, that, that Luke records, and with many other words did he testify in his Lord, saying, save yourselves from this untold generation. Now, here's what happens in verse 41. Then... They received his word. I'm sorry. Then they, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. What a beautiful phrase. Who was baptized? They that gladly received his word. It makes me think, and I wish I could, I had time, and maybe we might hear a sermon on this. Receiving the word of God should not be, a, it should not be a work. It should not be something like, oh man, I got to do Bible study again. And I'm not talking to it because I'm basically, I'm to the, this, preaching to the choir. But for so many out there, the word of God is fearful. It's causing them to be fearful, causing people to be afraid because it does do three things. And I said this last night, I'll say it again. The word of God reproves, rebukes, and, 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 and exhorts. It does three things. That's what the Bible says that the word of God does. Now, keeping that in mind, some people shy away from the word of God. Quite frankly, unsaved people shy away from the word of God. And some saved people who've received Christ, and we're going to go somewhere on this one today, they come into Christ, but don't want to go any further because the, 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 the breadth, the scope, the depth of the word of God, because it's true. Um, we, we said that at, at 12 o'clock. It says, oh, praise the Lord, all you nations, praise him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And what? The truth of the Lord endureth forever. Now, keeping that in mind, we, we see this, that the Bible says that they that gladly received his word were baptized. In other words, everybody who heard the word, received the word, they, they responded to the word by doing what? Being baptized. I, I, every Sunday, and I say this sometimes, every Sunday there needs to be a response, a response from everyone in the building. If you're saved, your response. And listen, I, I don't care who preached. When the word of God is even as much as read, there's a necessity of response. Did you hear it? Yes. Do you want to respond to it? Yes. When God moves in a wider way and speaks to your heart, it do not back up, do not back out. Let the word of God speak to you because if it reproves, if it rebu rebukes, and if it exhorts, either way, we're benefited by what the word of God does. So we have to gladly receive it. When I was a young preacher, I used to hear old preachers say, now if it hits you, say, ouch. Don't get mad about the word. Let it fix you. Let it minister to you. Sometimes we don't want to do it. It's just like if you get a cut, Reverend Elvis, you don't want to get stitches because it hurt to get the stitches. But you know what happened? You go ahead and get the stitches because you want your arm to do what? You want it to heal. All right. And so he says this here. They had to glad to receive the word. Glad to receive the word is for the unsaved becoming saved. And glad to receive the word also is for the saved to be strong in their salvation. The Bible says on the, in this context, they that glad to receive his word were baptized. And the Bible says, and that's in the same day that were added unto them about 3,000 souls. On that day, 3,000 people gladly received the word of God. And therefore, they gladly received Jesus Christ. At the beginning of chapter 2, there was 120 Christians. At the end of chapter 2, there was 3,120 Christians. 
somebody says uh, tried to explain to me the exponentialist nature of that number and i don't understand exponents necessarily but what i do understand is how great that day must have been that there were people who came to have an encounter with god at the pentecost festival but they had an encounter like they had never could never have imagined they came ready to go through the ritual but they left with a relationship they came to sing songs but they left with a song in their heart they came dusty and tired looking to be refreshed but they came uh, they left revived renewed re refreshed having received the word of god and so i love that and i say that let remind us today that this is how the church grows today uh the church grows by the word of god the church grows when people glad to receive the word of god the church grows when people um um hear the word and receive it and then i'm deciding to move on it the bible says that this happened on that day and three thousand souls were saved and were baptized now verse beginning at first 42 to verse 47 five important verses in this we see the what's next well what happens when somebody comes to christ what's next what happens when somebody receives jesus and is baptized what's next what happens when somebody accepts christ and moves out of the darkness of the marvelous light the question is what's next there and i'm going to say this this is the big, to me, problem in the modern church. We have all methods and all types of technology at our disposal. We have things that I've, even in our lifetime, some of us never knew. I was talking to somebody the other day and I was telling them that when I first heard Michael Jackson, it was on an eight track tape and it was. But now I don't even have to have a cassette, a CD, a record, nothing. All I got to do is download it from somewhere in the cloud. I still haven't figured out what the cloud is, but it's up there somewhere. And I can download music on my phone or download music on my on my computer, download music on my iPad. What I'm saying is, is that the, that the church misses on opportunities because we don't apply the what's next. The what's next. Here's what was next. Here's what makes a strong Christian. And here's what makes a strong church. Verses 42 through 45, 47 tell us what we need to do and i want to i want to focus on one word I'm, I'm gonna get to in a minute and what the church needs to do to grow a lot of times people come to christ and we've seen this before saint peter it's a revolving door they come to christ in crisis when they feel bad after church they keep on moving but to really grow in the lord to be established in him to be rooted and grounded in him requires the what's next let me go ahead and get to it verse verse 42 says they continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine let me stop there those two words, they continue. What does that mean? They never stopped. And what does that next word mean, steadfastly? That means that it was a de de diligent, deliberate action. That every day, these people that had come to Christ, about 3,000 souls, did not get up the next morning and say, well, I'm saved. I'm going to get back to what I used to do. Or let me get back to work. Or let me get back to my family. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Every day they got up with the idea of the mindset to say, I'm going to hear the word of God, the apostles doctrine and steadfast means that they did not let anything distract them from their continuing in the apostles doctrine. The apostles doctrine was declared word of God through the apostles at that time. And so what that meant was they wanted more. They wanted more. They wanted more of the apostolic doctrine. Why? Because they knew they came from God. They continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. So it's just time to song. Please write down steadfastly for me. Um, uh, in verse, the next part says they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and what else? Fellowship. If anybody ever looked at our um, um, the church vision, what, what do we call it? System the church. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Edification, advantages of fellowship. What is our? That's our motto. Theme. That's our theme. It's three things, evangelism, edification, fellowship. And I'll be clear, I did not come up with this. I remember very vividly, I was on Georgia 400, going up the highway, taking the boys to a birthday party in March of 2004. And I had to pull over and write down what the Lord gave me. And that's what the Lord told me, evangelism, edification, fellowship. Fellowship is critical. And let me tell you why fellowship is critical. It's good, to, it's great to continue to step actually in the, in the apostolic doctrine. But continuing in fellowship is important because it's in the fellowship. That word fellowship means koinonia. That means there's a constant communion. There's constant communication. There's constant interaction with those who are in Christ. That, that word uh, fellowship is a critical word because in that word, what we see is um, the, the benefits um, 
of of how of how Christians work together. Let me just go ahead and share this transparently. One of the great benefits, and I said this before, and I say it again, of the of the Deacon Family Ministry of St. Peter is they fellowship. I think, and I know it was God said, and I thank Deacon Elvis for hearing from the word, hearing God during the pandemic. Because when we started, the deacon started coming there, uh, opening the doors and collecting money. Uh, deacon Thomas, it turned from just being um, a, a routine act activity to being a powerful fellowship. I remember the very beginning of the pandemic seeing Deacons Edwards and Jordan and Thomas and Lyons, and pretty soon it just kept growing and growing and growing. And it became an all right fellowship. The music will be rolled out, and pretty soon there'd just be nonstop conversation going back and forth. And then pretty soon it was Deacon Rose, and then it was Deacon uh, Covington, and then he looked up and it was Deacon Elliot, and then it was Deacon um, King and Deacon Brown. That was a fellowship, quite because they were able, and I used to come up there and hang out as much as I could, they were able to encourage one another during that season. They weren't able to encourage one another. Now what you have is camaraderie, and it still continues. Fellowship is important. If you are a Christian, you need to have some Christian folk you fellowship with, and it's not about you know, getting, it's not about getting in folk business, it's about getting to know each other so that you can do what? Encourage, strengthen, help, be a blessing to one another. Every day, these new believers, there's 3,000 people. Immediately after um, the day of Pentecost, immediately after they had received Christ and been baptized, they said, I want more doctrine, but I want more fellowship. I want to talk to more and more people who, who are beneficiaries of what I've had. Now, the good news is, they went back home to their various places throughout the known world. And what did they do? They shared Christ. And what happened there? They continued in the doc, studying the doctrine and a fellowship. Fellowship is important. One of the things why, as a result of evangelistic church, the reason why we must fellowship is because a lot of the people that come to Christ through St. Saint, Saint Peter won't have anybody at home in the fellowship with. They won't have a prayer partner. They won't have... Um, somebody who can instruct them in the word of God. And so sometimes if they don't fellowship at the church and we don't fellowship with them, guess what? They could easily fall prey to, uh, I'm by myself, I'm alone. God did not call us to be Christians in a vacuum. We are body of Christ. Let me say it again, a body of Christ, which means we have to work together. Fellowship is important. Fellowship is important. And that's what they did. They continued in doctrine and fellowship. Now, let me keep, let me keep it going. They continued in breaking of bread. Um, the breaking of bread is representative of the communion. You remember we just did it last Sunday. And you remember in John chapter 14 and even in the book of Mark, we see, um, sorry, John chapter 13, in the book of Mark, we see that Jesus says, this bread represents my body. This blood represents my, um, this wine represents my blood. He said, do this as often as you get together in remembrance of me. And remember of what, Jesus? To remember what I did on your behalf. Remember what God initiated the piss plan of salvation that manifests itself through Jesus Christ. I like this picture. They were only about 60 days out from Jesus's ascension. They were probably only about, um, um, I don't know, uh, um, about, yeah, about, they were about 60 days out from Jesus's death and resurrection. They were about 10 days out from his ascension. But look what happened. They did not want to forget what Jesus had done. And as a result, they did communion um, steadfastly. They did not just do it from time to time. We do it first Sunday. Somebody asked me one time. Uh, well, I didn't even ask me. They told me, you know, they did um, 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 communion first Sunday in the Bible. I said, no, they did it every day, really, in the Bible. I said, we just chose the first Sunday to do it. Some church choose second Sunday. What's in the Bible is that you do it steadfastly, that you do it in remembrance of what Jesus did on our behalf, in remembrance of what God did for us, in remember the love of God, the power of God, the love of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, in his death and his resurrection from the dead. They did it every day. They were steadfast in breaking of bread. They really, and I can imagine, I don't know if Mother Phelps is on, but I remember Mother Phelps, man, I remember having told me the story years and years ago. That communion um, back in the day wasn't just something we got out the way. And, and I think, and I like St. Peter because we're moving more toward co co the, the thought process of com communion. Communion means you think about it. You remember what was done. You don't just take the bread and take the cup and keep going. You, you think about the sacrifice of Jesus, the love of God, because he didn't have to do it. They did it steadfast. And I can imagine it strengthened their Christian walk because they could not drift from the reality of Jesus, God's love and Jesus' sacrifice and his death on the cross. Last thing they continued, my brother and sister, was prayer. They prayed all the time. They kept praying. Every time, I can imagine, 
is they were finishing up the Pentecost feast. Every time they see each other, they break out in a little prayer group. I, I can see it. Every time Reverend Leslie, they, they saw, ran into each other, they grab hands and start praying. I can imagine why, because there was a level of excitement that was unprecedented in human history in which they were praying and calling on the God who they knew to be near. In the Old Testament, only certain people could pray. The high priest was the one who went into the presence of God. But they knew through their relationship with God, through Jesus Christ, that they could pray anytime, anywhere, about anything. And I imagine they took full advantage of it. I had a classmate from college who I would run into from time to time at Target. And she talked about, you talking about somebody love to pray. I remember one time we were there and we were talking and she, and she asked me what's going on. I shared with her something going on. And we in the aisle at Target praying like we were in the sanctuary at some church. And I thought about it. And I said, that's what, what God wants the body of Christ to do. Just pray anybody. Pray about all. Pray anytime, all the time. Pray without ceasing. Pray because it's an excitement. Her And I pray a lot, but her excitement about, it was, like, it was almost like I said, hey, I need uh, a piece of candy. She said, here it is. Hey, I'm going through this right here. Let's pray. That's the excitement that we all ought to have every day about prayer. The, the new disciples, the new believers were, were excited about it, and they continue steadfastly in prayer. I, I say these things because they're in the Bible, but I share these things in this context because this is what each of us need to understand our lives. We should be always in the Word. We should always seek to fellowship with other believers. We should always take communion very seriously as to, as to remind us of what Jesus did, which keeps our relationship fresh and new and full of joy. And finally, we should continue in prayer. That's what we should do. There's no way around it. This is how the church grew. It grew, and I'm not talking about just numbers now. I'm talking about how the believers grew. If you want to be a strong Christian, these are things you do. As we want to be a strong church, these are the things we do. Because a strong church doesn't come by itself. It comes through strong Christians. Strong Christians make a strong church. And so I'm saying this to us today because while we may have done great things, we can get stronger, and this is the way we do it. And I want to say this. This is pastorally now. It's good that we do it, that you do it. But it's only going to get, it, it only works if we share what we know with somebody who's not doing it. I'm glad that we got 56 people on um, more or less every every night in the neighborhood between 35 and 50 somewhere in there, 56 somewhere in there, depending on the night. But there's so many more people that, that we could reach if we did it. If we say, hey, you in Christ, right? Yeah. Well, come on, Jesus. Come on, let's start the word together and remind them these four things. Tell them if you want to be strong, you got to stay in the word, stay in fellowship, continue to consider and, and, and break the bread and think about what Jesus did and stay in prayer. We have all these opportunities, St. Peter, to pray and to start the word of God. Let's do it. Let's share it. And let's be a stronger church. Verse 43. I love this. As a result of these four things, steadfast study, Steadfast fellowship, steadfast breaking of bread and steadfast prayers. A fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Here's what happened. That fear is not fright. Again, it's reverence. Every soul reverenced God. And when every soul reverenced God, Reverend Edwards, they reverenced one another. They, they had a love for one another. They had a care for one another. What did that open the door for? Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Why? Because that was a uh, 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 a foundation of faith and belief. And so nobody stood if God, the Holy Spirit moved on, a, on an individual on, on, on one of the apostles said, do this right here. Nobody was standing there not believing. They were standing there believing and praying for whatever the request was. Great things, uh, signs and wonders are still being done today when we have a, 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 a as we operate in the spirit of, of, of God that he has given us and as we operate in a steadfastness. The Bible says, verse 44, and all that believe were together and had all things common. <clears throat> they were all together. I'm going to read it real slow. And they that believe were together. This goes back to chapter 2, the early verse in the end of chapter 1, where it lets us know they were on one accord. But now this word together is, a, is, a, is not just a mindset. It's a physicality. It's a physical space. They were together. They, they worked together. They worshiped together. They prayed together. They took communion together. They studied the word together. And as a result, they had all things in common. In other words, nobody looked over and said, ah, he broke. Oh, she ain't got nothing. They, verse 50, 45 says, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as many as every man had need. We look at the world and we want, we look at the big gap, the big desperate gap between who has and who have not. And that's the world. 
But too many times in the church, we allow that same spirit to break out when we look down upon others. The reality is in the body of Christ, there's a necessity for us to look, recognize that our brothers and sisters of Christ, if they don't have, fundamentally, we don't have. Um, and, and, it's, and it's that that grows beyond the walls of the church, the world will change. There's a gentleman who's a part of, uh, and I say a part of St. Peter, and he may not walk down now, but he serves as a part of St. Peter Missionary and Baptist Church. But out of his love for God and out of his care for others, he his, 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 what he has, he shares. Why? Because of what God has given him, not financially, but out of his heart. See, this concept of, um, and they sold out their position and good and part of them, possession of goods and part of them to all men as every man had need. That wasn't about the amount of money. It wasn't like that there was 3,000 billionaires. It was 3,000 people who were Christians and their Christianity moved them to share what they had with others. Does anybody see what I'm saying? That it's not about how much money you have. You got a dollar and you can that dollar, that 50 cent or 25 cent of that dollar. You do it as the spirit of God leads you. And that's what they were doing. They were sharing and they gave their goods and part of them to all men. As whoever had need, that's what they received. I'm going to go ahead and read these last two verses. I know I'm over time. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They back to one accord. That means they were there um, in one mind, and they breaking bread from house to house. They, they, they moved around. This breaking of bread now is not so much about communion, but it's about the fellowship. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Their singleness of heart was not self. Their singleness of heart was on God. We have our eyes on God and our hands in his hand, and when we focus on him, our hearts, all of the other drama, all of the other distractions, all of the stressors, all of the strains, all of the uh, disoriented things of life fall away when we fix our heart and our minds on God, that singleness of heart. Finally, this is what they did together, my brothers and sisters. They praised God. And because they praised God and did these things, they had faith with all the people. What does that mean? That means the Christians respected one another, but also means that everybody who was watching them had to respect them. Why? Because they operated in a way that mankind had never seen. Never before had mankind seen people love and cherish and, 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 and trust each other like this, work together. Never again, never before had been seen. And so they had faith with all the people. And you know what the result of that was? You know what God did? You know what God did as a result? of this steadfastness in the word, um, the, the communion, um, in fellowship and in prayers. You know what God did as a result of the fear that came upon every soul and everybody sharing what they had? You know what God did as a result of them continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and eating meat with gladness, singing as a heart? You know what God did as a result of them praising God and the reality of their having faith with all the people? The Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. In other words, God had a number. It wasn't the number of, of that the disciples had chosen. The disciples didn't say how many people are going to choose. God says, I'll choose as a result of what you all are doing for me, through me, and because of your relationship with me. I'm going to stop exactly at 730, but I sure do thank God for this verse, and I pray hard, and I pray before by the thing that we hear this, we apply it to our lives, individually and we apply to our church lives so that we as believers may experience the fullness of the power of God. I'm going to call a time out. I love y'all. Let us pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just love you so much and we thank you so much for all of your blessings, all of your grace and all of your mercy. God, we praise your name, Lord, because you truly have been good and you've been good to us. And so God, tonight we pray that as we break up from this class and dismiss from this class and from these various platforms. We pray, God, that you bless the individual Christians, the families, and the, and the um, homes that are represented, the households that are represented here tonight. I pray, God, that you get in our hands and feet, that you let your word get in our hands and feet, that we can serve you better. Lord, let your word get in our hearts, that we may be strengthened, we may be strengthened in our inner person. Lord, let your word get uh, uh, in our ears, that we may hear your word over the winds of the world. God, let your word get on our minds and and, and in our, uh, in, on our minds, in our minds, we might have peace that surpasses all understanding and that the fire darts will say, let your word get on our lips, tongues, vocal, lungs, and throat. That we may declare your word to a dying world, to each other, and finally, Lord, to ourselves. God, I pray tonight that you would uh, give us peace and joy, that you grant us grace and mercy, and let us experience your love. God, again, I ask you to build the head of protection around us that the fire darts will say will be quenched. God, I pray that you would Give us the posture of praying without ceasing, rejoicing in you, 
giving you thanks in all things, knowing that these things are your will for those of us in Christ Jesus. And finally, Lord, don't let us quench your Holy Spirit, but instead, Lord, let your spirit have his way in us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, St. Peter. Hold on, Zoomers.